Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jamie Bassance, Visitor Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Uh, thank you for attending today's challenge chat on uh, martial arts and the U.S. Armed Forces. So safety is a top priority, so almost all of our programming is virtual right now, but uh, the Missouri History Museum and Soldiers Memorial are open Wednesday through Sunday with uh, several safety precautions in place, and we'd love for you to visit if you feel safe. Uh, we recommend that you make advanced reservations to visit any of our locations. You can do that at our website, which is mohistory.org. Uh, before we start, I want to thank all of the Missouri Historical Society members for their support, which allows us to put on programs like this. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member or in receiving MHS newsletters, I'll put links in the chat once the program gets going uh, where, that you can follow to do that. Uh, a few logistical details as well. So this is going to be a roughly 20 to 30 minute presentation, followed by 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. You can submit questions through the Q&A button uh, in your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please know that we'll do our best, but we might not have time to get to all of the questions. Today's presentation is being recorded, so if you want to see it again or if you want to share it with someone else who couldn't make it today, it'll be posted on uh, the Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel uh, hopefully a couple days from now. Your feedback is important to us, and we'd appreciate it if you could answer a few questions for us after the program. Uh, so a toolbox survey should automatically open in a tab in your browser, so when you leave the program, please keep an eye out for that. Uh, so our speaker for today is uh, Kunal Bajwa. There he is. And I'll let him uh, take it from here. All right. Thank you very much, JV. Uh, thank you for everyone for having me here today. Um, all right, let's get started. If it'll let me. There we go. Cool. All right. So as Jamie introduced me, Today, I am covering the martial arts in the U.S. and uh, within the U.S. Armed Forces. So I have them labeled all up here today. All right, so I just want to give you guys a quick background on who exactly I am. Uh, I am uh, someone who's done martial arts since he was 17 years old. And in the past five years, I've done a really deep dive into three main martial arts. And I'm going to cover them. Uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, they are Jeet Kune Do, Jim Fang Kung Fu, I go by two names, Kali, and Silat. I've also had exposure to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Tai Jitsu, and American style karate. I've been fortunate enough to uh, go through all these deep dives in those three martial arts I, I initially mentioned from a guy called Dan Asano at his seminars that he holds all around, actually not even just the United States, but the world. He goes very different places. Um, so my goals for this presentation are along the lines of infotainment. Let's be honest with each other. It's been a horribly, horrible year. Uh, it's been very challenging. And I thought a way to like give you information as well as to make it a little less terrible is also by having you go and kind of do your own research in the way of watching action movies. Uh, so you'll find out as soon as I, as soon as I keep on going. And uh, so a couple of considerations for this. I have compiled this through uh, interactions that I've had in person with people that I've met, uh, veterans that I've met in the Inasano program who are instructors and are retired now, as well as research from all across uh, uh, sources and library and whatnot from there. Uh, it still kind of surprises me and kind of makes me smile and chuckle when I, like to this day, even Martial arts are still very much orally passed down. Uh, do keep in mind that in the research I've done, there is a level of confidentiality. So I have basically done my best to draw the, draw the lines where the dots are and kind of give you my best analysis for it. If someone who's a veteran that, uh, that comes along and tells you something different, please listen to them because I'm only 140 pounds, 5'6", and I know what I know from all the experiences I have. Uh, I do want to make one point because it has been a very uh, tumultuous year for better or for worse. And uh, with the discussions of police brutality and whatnot, uh, I do want to say that I'm an advocate of learning what martial arts can teach you for the body, for yourself, for spirituality, for whatnot. Uh, I study it more for coordination and understanding the story behind it, not so much the violence that's associated with it. It's definitely a part of it. It's unmistakable, but 
uh, there's always a proportional response to every situation that happens. So I want that to be clear before we go any further. All right, and to start with, uh, this isn't actually used in the military, but the mindset of what Jeet Kune Do and Jun, Jun Fan Gung Fu is, uh, is present throughout the research that I've done for this presentation today. So let's talk about it. Like, what is it exactly? Roughly in the 60s and 70s, it's founded by two main guys who are pictured right up here. Uh, Dan and Asanto is on the left and on the right is Bruce Lee. Uh, it's a very famous picture of them actually. Uh, it's an emphasis on street fighting, adaptability. Fighting can go anywhere. Uh, so take what you can from every martial art, learn it, understand it, know why it's there. And then if it's not really useful to you, your stature, your personality, there's no need to keep it. So uh, there's a common phrase of take absorb what is useful and hack away at the inessentials. Uh, as I said, this mindset's highly, highly present in this research because the military takes very specific martial arts and uses them to whatever kind of uh, situations they're in and really specializes to what's going on. A great movie example for this is Enter the Dragon. It is a bit dated, but uh, it is fun to watch and it's just got a cool 75 to it. I mean, who doesn't love that? All right, so I've mentioned this guy a couple times. Who is he? Uh, what's his importance? And I'll cover that. This is a, a picture of Dana Asano when he was, in, was, he, when he was an airman. Uh, he was born on July 24th, 1936 in Stockton, California. He was a paratrooper of the 101 Airborne Division, a strategic army corps from 1959 to 1961. Fun fact, he was actually a history teacher. So that's pretty cool. Uh, his father, Sebastian uh, in Asano, was the founder of the Filipino Agricultural Labor Association. So why is that important? What's the, what's the big deal when it comes to that in martial arts and the military, what have you? So at this time, uh, there is a group of constabularies or gendarme forces, politically appointed uh, civilians of the Philippines uh, who fought on the American side. Now the army is not desegregated at this point. It's, it happens three years after World War II. And so, so because of this, they're their own force and they uh, operate within mostly of the naval capacity. Uh, a number of these constabularies far in the war for us. Uh, I've even heard of a story of uh, someone from the constabulary that would, uh, specifically during the Bataan Death March, the Japanese would take dead bodies and put them in trees to kind of show uh, a force of strength and whatnot. And so he would hide as one of those people. And, and then uh, as Japanese forces would walk by, he would jump down and attack those battalions and then consistently do this over and over. Uh, they were a force to be reckoned with, uh, not someone to be trifled. So the importance of this is, is such. The constabularies are now all retired and living in the United States. A lot of time has passed. All of them are now farmers. And Sebastian uh, orchestrated that they would get economic aid because times were tough at this, at this point. As a thank you, they offered to train his son. So you have decades and decades and years of martial knowledge and familial knowledge because martial arts is very familiarly passed down to this man and to select others. But for this presentation, Dan Sano is the one I'll be concentrating on. Uh, so one of the main arts that Dan and Asana is known for is an art called Kali. And I'll talk about it as soon as I find a spot right here. That's the symbol for Kali. It is a martial system developed in the Philippines. It translates, it's a, it's a combination of two words actually, Kamot and Lihok. They take the first two letters of it and call it Kali. It translates to hand motion. Uh, because the Philippines has been invaded by so many other, uh, other cultures, it kind of goes by different names. Uh, since the Spanish invaded and established a very strong presence there, you hear arnis or escrima, which translates to like stick or kind of a sword-like understanding. Uh, it also uses weapons. It's very, it's very well known for using weapons, uh, big machete knives, sarongs, bastones, which are the sticks that are being held by Dan and Asano in the top right picture. Uh, it has a lot of joint locks, leverage, its own form of kickboxing, uh, and much, much more. 
there is an interesting thing to note. Uh, whenever cultures do intersect with each other, unmistakably, they're never the same again. So a really cool example is uh, naval boxing influence. So uh, when Danny Asano was actually researching a lot of Filipino uh, combat systems and whatnot, he was working with one of his masters. And at this point, I believe Bruce Lee had unfortunately passed away. Uh, as they were going over kickboxing counters, specifically what's known as attack by combinations, uh, he kind of paused and pulled out a book of his bag and saw that the our form that he was learning from the Filipino master was identical to naval boxing, leading credence to the fact that naval boxing was highly influenced by Filipino uh, martial arts and Filipino martial arts had been highly influenced by US naval martial arts. Um, so that's really cool to see. Uh, essentially, you would often see Filipinos fighting with two different knives and hitting the vital organs and vital parts of the body that, that could be uh, to their advantage. Now uh, they would kind of put the knives down and wear gloves and hit the same targets, but and then use their arm, use their hands differently. Uh, for example, a lot of the constabularies were trained in these kind of methods in World War II. Uh, and so for the movie examples that I promised you guys, definitely the Born Identity is a very big one. Matt Damon has trained the Guru Day in a bunch. I Frankenstein with Aaron Eckhart, and as well as the Taken series are all really good examples. And Silat. Uh, so the distinction that I should make here with Silat and Kali is that it is also a name that is often used between each other. Um, so the, the main distinction is like something, before we go further, there's something you should probably realize. Whenever anyone says martial arts in the United States, they often think of Asian fighting styles. That's not exactly accurate. I would broaden that definition to mean some, that as long as you have a military, you have a martial art. So pretty much everything uh, that has a fighting system or even like only a couple of different movements is considered a martial art. Boxing in America, I would consider a martial art. Um, so Silat is, uh, was often used interchangeably with Kali. The distinction between them is that it's meant more for grappling and especially like weapon-based grappling. Uh, it translates into the word to play. Uh, and it's often used the garambit, which is the uh, translates to tiger claw. It's a knife that's held with a little ring, and uh, the and usually comes out here. Uh, Danny Nisanto is actually the co-founder of what's known as the Majapayat Silat system. That is basically a uh, the combination of two different historical empires: the Srivijaya and the Majapahit. Now, basically, they include areas of, South, of the Southeast Asian Peninsula and surrounding countries like Singapore, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia. Uh, and this was their influence. And within their influence, the martial arts that they use are all versions of Silat. So not only did he get to train with masters of Kali, he got to train with masters of Silat at the same time. After working for decades with all of these masters, he compiled a blended version and called that Majapayat Silat system. Uh, a great example of this system would be shown in the movies, The Raid 1 and 2. Uh, the picture I have up on here is from the second raid and that's specifically in the kitchen scene. Uh, in fact, the actor on the right is an assassin that has two karambit blades that hook out from his belt buckle on the back. And on the right to the picture is a sarong or a waist clock, cloth that is often worn in the areas of the Majapayat. And it's, it can be used as a weapon. It's also very decorative at the same time. Uh, it's really cool. All right, so now I'm gonna cover the respective branches. To begin, let's start with the army. Their martial art, is called uh, MACP or the Modern Army Combatives Program. Uh, often is thrown, there's a term I'll be throwing around a lot today, which is CQC, Close Quarter Combat, just a heads up on that. To begin, they go through a, an idea of basic training and all military branches have this. So I'm gonna cover it here and then just kind of reference it later. For 
World War II, when World War II ended, there was two Englishmen, Will, William Fairbrain and Eric A. Sykes, and they essentially helped establish the initial uh, MACP. Over the past 20 years, after I've, I've spoken to a veteran who's, who uh, left the army, honorably discharged, uh, said that it's, it's been changed in the past 20 years, and uh, it's more of an idea of how to engage the enemy and uh, to keep in mind and be mindful of the gear that you're wearing and uh, how to move around easily and also because you'd be carrying a lot of equipment at the same time. It instills a lot of camaraderie and confidence between everyone that you have in the battalion. And in my conversations with said veteran, uh, there's a lot of American wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So those are both grappling forms that can, uh, that can keep either potential targets or as people they need to question or even civilians that they encounter that might be hysterical from war or non-compliant at the time. Uh, and Muay Thai and boxing for the what I call striking or punches and kicks, essentially is ways for, to keep people out of range and keep them to be able to attack them properly. Great, some movie examples are going to be The American Wrestler, which is a really interesting movie of a family that has, escapes the Iranian regime change in the 1980s and just faces a lot of racism. So one of the ways he combats it is by joining the wrestling team. Boxing, um, got an amazing picture here on our right of uh, Rocky IV. I recommend any of the Rocky movies, even Rocky V. Uh, they're all really fun to, to watch and get you really pumped up for anything. Does a great display of showing different types of, of American boxing around there. Uh, if you're looking for a Muay Thai example, Ong Bak by Tony Ja on the top right here. And uh, interesting to note that everywhere in the Majapahit system has a similar striking system to Muay Thai. Tony Ja is actually a, an student, a student of Dan and Asano. There's also a movie called Warrior, which is a great example of two brothers who fight against each other in the, in the UFC and a, a ton of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or full uh, ground combat is used here too. Uh, this, the veteran I spoke to also mentioned a movie called We Were Soldiers Once by Joe Galway, the novel. He recommended the novel over the movie because he said it was more, much more accurate. In fact, he was even interviewed during the, the writing of the novel. All right, uh, then the Marine Corps. So the Marine Corps martial arts is called MICMAP, or Marine Corps Martial Arts Program. Uh, Essentially, their, their idea is to always be weapon-based. They're always carrying a bayonet and their rifle with them at all times. They often are often have about five different levels of appropriate violence and response. And I've outlaid them at the bottom picture right here. The levels three to five are actually ones that require them to do actual harm to someone if they absolutely need to. The goal is not to be a straight killer. It's, it's someone to be an intelligent person to restrain and also attack uh, a situation and address it accordingly. They use a lot of Kali, a lot of Muay Thai, BJJ, Silat, and much, much, much more. A lot of things have left over from World War II, especially considering their interactions with the, the Americans' interactions with the Chinese police. A lot of uh, martial arts movements came in through there as well. Uh, a really good movie example for this is going to be The Equalizer 1 and 2. They do a good job of showing a former Marine who fakes their death, Denzel Washington's character, and then goes off and decides to become kind of a Robin Hood vigilante for people who are underrepresented. All right, the Air Force. Initially, I was going to have Mark Sundlov uh, talk a little bit about this but uh, he's taking care of a family issue now. We wish him the best. He actually spent some time in the Air Force and I was able to, to get some insights from him. Uh, so it initially was, did it also include Space Force? And uh, I'm not able to honestly cover Space Force because it's since, since it's such a brand new branch, uh, I would only assume that a lot of the Air Force's understanding, training, and technology would be transferred over and then changed for accordingly. So I'll cover what I know from the, about the Air Force. Uh, essentially, they use what's on the top right picture over here, which is pugil stick training. Uh, they're always carrying their rifle with them. So a lot of their combat basically comes from there. And since 
they are trained in uh, with that, they also have the mindset of not necessarily engaging the enemy. They're more dispatching the enemy and running away back to their plane. So a lot of Aikido, which translates is a Japanese art that translates into a way of the harmonious spirit. Um, and Judo, which is a leverage system and American kickboxing, as well as forms of karate. And it is often used for escape and combat assistant. Their uh, basic training is known as beast training. And um, so movie examples, uh, John Wick 2, which is on the bottom right picture over here, he uses a lot of judo, specifically in the warehouse scene when he's getting um, attacked by people who are basically members of a chop shop and there's, they're trying to send taxis to try and run him over, but he keeps on dodging. Really, really fun scene to watch. Uh, John Wick 3, there's a, there's a scene where he goes back to a dull stomping grounds in the, the Romani, and they're doing a bunch of flips and turnovers, specifically with these two guys right here, and it's the same training he went through as a child. For Aikido, uh, a great movie to watch is Steven Seagal's Above the Law. He's a police officer who uh, takes sick, like people are running after him and he's taking a bunch of cyclical energy, turns them over and does a bunch of wrist locks like that. Uh, if you want a good example of American kickboxing and karate, then the new Cobra Kai series is wonderful for that. There's actually a new season coming up in a month. Uh, they do a good job of showing what is known as either Okinawan or Chito Ryu karate. All right, and this slide honestly could be its own slide and presentation. A bunch of slides in this presentation could be its own presentation. Uh, so the Navy SEALs, they are a special forces team and also the hardest I had to, re one of the hardest I had to research. Uh, SEALs basically cover for sea, air, land uh, teams. They're very specialized. They're not like the Marines or infantrymen in the army. They're very small. There's only about five to 10 of them in each team. Uh, their primary methods are stealth, intelligence, infiltration, evac, elimination, capture. They're very multifaceted and they have a lot of confidentiality. And because of that, it's uh, kind of difficult to do a lot of research for them. I have encountered Navy SEALs by word of mouth and by association. So what I've been able to piece together is that they're some of them have actually potentially used their, their Kali, CLOT, and BJJ within the Navy SEALs. Um, I have noticed that a lot of Korean Marines utilize a lot of knife work. And as I was watching demonstrations of their knife work, it looked way too much like Filipino martial arts, specifically Kali and CLOT. So I have a strong suspicion that it's there. Uh, the Navy SEALs are also, also known for their, their Hell Weeks, which pretty much every mar uh, branch of the military has, but they're the one known for having it be known very, um, very famous as such. Uh, the best example I could show for in terms of not even just martial arts, but just a multifaceted character that had so many different skills of tech, tech, uh, tactics, munitions, demolitions, and specifically very, very good scenes of knife work and boxing, uh, kickboxing especially, was Steven Seagal's Under Siege back in the 80s. Very controversial figure, but very, very fun and entertaining movie to watch. All right, the Coast Guard. Now, granted, the Coast Guard is more of a search and rescue team for naval-based operations. It has the highest civilians that work in tandem with the government. Uh, and uh, they do have their own basic training. They don't have a whole lot of CQC. Uh, in fact, this was probably next to the Navy, the hardest part to research for this. Uh, the only portion that I could see where they had any kind of counter-terrorist or special operations group was the Maritime Security Response Team. And that's the emblem on the right on the pictures. They work in tandem with SEALs and other organizations. So I have a very strong suspicion that a lot of training has definitely been, tra uh, been traded for that portion. They're known as a DOG or DSF team or Deployable Operations Group. They work in uh, and essentially 
the only example I could really find for them was the first part of the Expendables, uh, where they are, so they're primarily known as an anti-piracy team. And in the beginning of the Expendables, they're using very specific equipment that looks very naval sea-like. Uh, they descend on a ship and eliminate a Somali pirate team that has taken over a naval ship. And uh, that's basically it for me today. I just wanted to give a couple people different thanks. Uh, honestly, the Inasano community for allowing me to do all this information and ask questions. Daniel Onero, uh, Guru Dan Inasano, Guru Matthew Stumpf, Guru Anton Summer, Guru Nathan Hunt, Dr. Fran Levine, Michael Venzo, and Dr. Mark Sunlov. Uh, just to add some validity so that I'm not some crazy kid who's just spouting information, here's a picture of me at actually one of the CELOC camps where I got to hear a lot of the information for this presentation uh, within Misano. I was very tired that day. And here's a quick credit picture just for everybody. Thank you, Kunal. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we actually don't have any uh, questions in the question box yet. So I thought I'd get us kicked off. Sure. Um, you mentioned that uh, the Air Force and the Marines uh, focus on um, styles that, that assume that they're holding a rifle uh, yes. and, and that they would never be empty handed. Um, is there anything about the, um, the methods or the mission of the Army that makes grappling techniques especially suitable? Yes, uh, from what I've understood from the infantrymen that they're they are, so it's a strength in numbers kind of understanding, and they, since they come in contact with so much civilians, they don't always want to have their weapon drawn, as far as I can tell. So they definitely will say that, you know, you, you'll be practicing with your weapons the entire time, but uh, they have to be mindful of the gear that they're carrying and that they're going to be coming in contact with civilians more often. So I think that's the understanding that I got from that. I think that, I hope that answers your question. So maybe less lethal? Yes, uh, at least less less athletical. Uh, although I'm sure uh, they would disagree that they are not less lethal. But yeah. um, um, I just saw a comment that uh, Dan Inasano's daughter uh, was in the Mandalorian recently. Yes, he was Diana Lee Inasanto. I, uh, I you see. I, I actually there is a whole presentation I could do on the Inasano family in Hollywood. Uh, like he's been in he's been in every single thing. So many different things. Uh, when you go to the if you and when you go to the academy uh, after COVID is is all taken care of, uh, there are pictures there from celebrities that you would not even suspect. Jean Claude Van Damme is on there. Mr. T is on there. Burt mm -hmm. Reynolds was a student. Uh, you name it, they've they've taught him. Uh, but yeah, that was Diana Lee and Asano, and it was a uh, just such a gift to see her there. Uh, she was using a lot of Philippines. So the Filipinos also use staffs as well. And the technology, the I say technology, but the martial arts she was using there was Filipino staff based. And I have actually I've done some of that too. So it's the, I definitely geeked out a ton. <laughs> I was very happy. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is a little, I know that the the movie thing was not uh, kind of the focus of what you were trying to tell us today, but I I'm, I'm, can't help but be curious whether Please you do. know anything about um, the process for, uh, I, I know a, a lot of films get like martial arts masters to kind of mm -hmm. advise and help with choreography and everything like that. Um, do you know anything about how they choose like what styles and, and how they find people and what that yeah. process looks like? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really, really good question. Honestly, it depends what they're going for. It depends what what they want to showcase the most. Um, the The thing that's always that's coming to my mind right now is that uh, there's a group called Eighty Seven Eleven. Uh, you might have before they were even formed. They used to they worked on this this little movie called The Matrix, and uh, and so essentially one of Inusano's top students was a guy named De Chad Stahelski. And in, in order for the essence of time, I'll skip over a lot, but essentially uh, he began a lot of the process of, instead of just having a stunt double jump in and have them do most of the work that they would often actually train the actors at the same time. So like if you're watching Daredevil, uh, because he uses a lot of Kali as well in the Netflix series, uh, they actually switch out the stunt double on the actor. So sometimes when you're watching, 
you don't you might be seeing the stunt double, you might be seeing the actor. Uh, so to answer your question, because I'm diverging a little bit, it really depends on what the director is looking for. And often they'll look up stunt doubles and the stunt doubles will say, oh yeah, you know, we can totally, like they're not just doubles, they're also people who choreograph as well. So the oh. stunt doubles will give a lot of input and they'll like uh, for Halle's Berry, Halle Berry's character in uh, John Wick 3, she was actually trained by a stunt double named Heidi Moneymaker. That's her actual last name, I'm not joking. Um, and they uh, th they go and be like, oh, you know, well, this this move will work better here. This horror move will work better here. So they do a lot in terms of uh, training them, choreographing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if we're if we're looking at these movies as kind of examples of these different um, these different forms, sure. uh, what kinds of sacrifices need to be made for the sake of uh, filmmaking? Uh, I, I imagine they try to stay as true as possible, but that it it can't really be possible to um, to do it perfectly, right? Right. That's that's a, you're asking some really good questions. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No. No. It's it's good. Uh, uh, there was a clip I saw with Matt Damon a couple years ago. Like he's it was a short clip and it was it was a bit goofy too. Uh, it was meant to be lighthearted. And he was talking about how when so you're essentially seeing a 3D thing, which is combat, on a 2D plane, which is right. uh, a projector screen, what have you. So whenever they fight, they often have to. Uh, so that's what he like. If you're going to throw a punch, you throw it like that. But if you're shooting a movie, you kind of would have to arc it. And there is, right. there is like, so everyone loves, uh, ever since Daredevil came around, everyone loves the, uh, the, the continuous shots where they don't cut. Mm -hmm. Because the moment they cut, you know that they've, uh, they've just slicing it together with a different scene. Uh, oddly, odd example, watch Singing in the Rain and see how many times uh, they actually cut. It's astounding. They only do it like twice. The actors there, like, phenomenally danced um gene kelly and um, the other name escapes me at the time but they did very short cuts uh which means they got they either had to run 10 minute act dancing scenes like four times at least uh which is just uh off hands off for them honestly that's astounding uh did i answer your question that totally did yeah okay cool we're actually, uh, we still don't have audience questions. Um, so I might ask uh, ask one last question if we don't have any. Uh, by then see, we could wrap I see up. One, I see one up here. I don't know if, how to click that. This is uh, uh, thanks from Dr. Fran Levine, oh. uh, the director of the Missouri Historical Society. Just no problem, uh, Fran. thanking you for your presentation today. Thank you, Fran. This, uh, Fran was actually the reason I started this podcast, uh, presentation. So oh, I didn't thank know that. you very much, Fran. You're the best. So uh, my last question is, uh, when you were talking about basic training, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about training in martial arts primarily as a kind of, well, basic training in general, mm -hmm. um, as primarily um, building trust and uh, and that kind of thing. And so I, I guess I wonder, we hope that the armed forces don't need to see combat at all. Uh, and then in a combat situation, uh, I, I guess I wonder, Mm. did any of the veterans that you spoke with uh, have anything to say about whether they had to use these techniques uh, in the line of duty? Yes. Uh, the the one I spoke to for the infantrymen uh, definitely said that. And uh, thank you, uh, Guru Nathan, for that. And he said he didn't, uh, he came to Kali Silat uh, and uh, Jeet Kune Do much later and outside of the army, actually. So that's why they're more heavily influenced on. They actually did at one time teach Kali and Silat to the army, but they decided against it because it was too much to teach infantrymen at the time. Uh, they were better off learning boxing, uh, Muay Thai, BJJ, American wrestling, just for the way that their organization works and the way that they're, what they come in contact with works. Uh, and also quite frankly, he said it was just easier for everybody. Uh, it, uh, I don't know how to say this nicely, but but the way that I'm, I'm quoting um, quoting him on this one, he's like, you need to have the person who has the highest IQ, IQ and the lowest IQ to be able to properly like defend themselves and attack somebody. So 
of, of, any, of any kind of stature and ability uh, because they had, you know, intelligence doesn't, you know, it depends on, on that aspect as well. So yes, and it was also interesting to hear him in a talk say that he was, uh, he was like, you know, war really isn't worth it at the end of the day. Uh, but we do, but I definitely, you know, he's like always support your veterans out there. So, yeah. Thank you. We uh, we got one audience question here uh, from Ahmad Johnson. Sounds like he may be a friend of yours. He yes. asks, uh, uh, out of all five branches, uh, which one displays the best utilization of these techniques in your personal opinion? Uh, am I am I going out on a limb and assuming that uh, he's a veteran? He is not. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he might mind. be pulling for one branch or another. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, and uh, thanks, AJ. Uh, <laughs> so in my personal opinion, if you're asking that question, I'll say this. It's, it's a very, I don't want to say that he asked a very dangerous question, but I will say it's a, it's a question that can be kind of loaded. And I know he didn't mean that. And I'm not blaming you, AJ. But I, I will say this. Uh, there is no perfect martial art, period. It's what works for your life. It's what works for your situations, your personality, which people don't really recognize, but your personality has a lot to do with how you fight. Uh, your training dictates a lot about who you are as a character. And for me, I would say that I, just because I found it, it's, it suits my kind of height, my stature, my personality. I like Kali Silat and, and Jeet Kune Do, but I, but I learned so much from jumping out of that sphere as well uh, because the human body can only move certain so many different ways until we develop four arms and four legs it's going to be pretty much the same at the end of the day a punch is a punch and a kick is a kick it's how you do it and how you understand it it really changes you uh, yeah that that's how i'll answer that question but you know, someone could be using BJJ and find that to be incredibly enlightening for them. And I applaud them for it. I, I say, keep going. I say, keep learning and uh, go from there. But to answer your question, for me, uh, because a lot of Kali and Sila and Indonesian Southeast Asian arts are built for people of my stature. So it works a little easier for me. That doesn't mean that you can't tweak it for someone taller or different. Yeah. Got it. I like how you handled that. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you again, Kunal, and thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Um, like I mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, there should be a short survey up in your browser when you exit out of the webinar. Uh, so if you'd be willing to put a little time into that, we'd greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, we put on two or three St. Louis History Live programs each week. Um, you can find out about those on our website, mohistory.org slash events, or on our Facebook page. Um, and we've got the next two events that'll be happening online up on the screen here. So the next one is uh, just tomorrow evening, a virtual tour of the city. Oh, um, thanks everyone for tuning in. See cool. you at the next one. Thank you very much, everybody.